So now in our final video on sensory input, we're going to be looking at one final way animals utilize a stimulus to trigger a simple or complex set of behaviors. The last idea of sensory input that we want to understand is animal communication, something that we see every single day, and now we're going to establish a really strong understanding of how it works in terms of animal behavior, why it's useful, and how it works. Two ultimate and proximate causation questions every animal behaviorist wants answered. So. Animal communication is all about the following. So we'll quickly define communication between animals as the following. It is simply the transmission, so that is the transmission, and the transmission is useless unless there is a reception. The transmission and reception, aka me transmitting to you right now and you receiving my transmission by hearing it. I'm communicating with you, so I am undergoing communication. Transmission and reception of mutually recognizable, mutually recognizable signals. So I am communicating to you, yes, I am of course transmitting and, and you are of course receiving, but if I started speaking in Spanish, many of you may not be able to absolutely recognize my transmission and thus the communication would be useless. There has to be a mutual recognition and thus a cohesive and um, coinciding transmission and reception between both animals in question or maybe more than one. So that's a great definition for communication. Let's look at some examples of the communication that we see. I gave you an auditory example. We're going to get to that one later. Communication can also very well be visual. You are looking at visual communication right now in terms of my writing. But more so specifically, we want to look at visual communication in an animal sense. And we understand that visual communication, first and foremost, is very fast. Seeing things happens very, very quickly. So long as you have the correct eye mechanisms and physiological ability to see, you can see quite fast. And specifically, when you see, you can see lots and lots of information because seeing provides a lot of power in terms of how much things you can actually view. And finally, uh, visual communication is a great way to indicate, and it does indicate position. So it indicates position. All three things that I just listed here are three super, super benefits of being able to visually transmit and receive mutually recognizable signals because they are fast, contain lots of information, and indicate position. Um, a good example of this could be something like body coloration. Animals can very clearly see body coloration and are able to communicate with each other, let's say, through a body coloration mechanism, aka if I am a very brightly colored frog, that's a coloration and that's a, going to be a visual stimulus that's going to trigger, let's say, the ability for an animal to not eat me because animals realize and learn that a bright body coloration may not be so good for consumption. Another great example of visual communication is through um, something called display. And specifically, we'll look at display. The best way to understand visual display is to look at an example in honeybees. So our example to understand display will be honeybees. Honeybees utilize the display visual communication in which they're going to display the location of a food source. Location of food source. But of course, they don't have the ability to point at a food source like we can. They have to utilize something a lot more complex, I would say, and they utilize dancing. Specifically, what we notice in honeybees is that when they do what we consider a round dance, that's in comparison or in contrast to what we consider a waggle dance, there are two completely different things that are communicated to a fellow bee, and they are going to be mutually recognizable. So a bee will transmit a round dance, and they hope that this will be received by another bee as the following. They hope that it will be received as a visual communication saying that food is close, food is nearby. And if there's a waggle dance done, that would tell the other bee in question that's asking, you know, is there food here? The food is far. 
So something as simple as a B completes a action that is as complex as a round and waggle dance to display and communicate the presence of food. A very, very interesting example uh, indeed. So that's our visual communication idea. There's also communication that can be auditory and I talked about auditory communication briefly through my example of transmission and reception. Auditory communication is also very very powerful. It does not utilize light so we're gonna say there's no light necessary. Over here there actually you need light. That's a, that's a necessity. But here an advantage is that you don't need any light so this can happen during the night and this actually occurs over much longer distances than visual communication can possibly do because eyes are limited into the distance that they can see but ears or auditory mechanisms can hear much longer distances than eyes can see their respective things in question. So I'm going to transmit an auditory signal and hope that it is received through a long distance. And then um, there are two ways to understand auditory communication in animals and those two ways are either calls or what we would consider songs. Calls and songs are two contrasting ideas, just like the round dance and the waggle dance. Calls are usually going to be short and simple sounds that are going to be heard very clearly, short, simple sounds that animals use to communicate. Songs, on the other hand, are a bit more complex. They are more complex, and they are usually utilized for more complex scenarios, like songs can be used as a courtship ritual between uh, two uh, birds, a male and a female, in which a male has to sing the correct song, the best song, for a female to choose that male. So those are auditory signals. Very clear. We use them as humans all the time, of course. Let's remember again, a stimulus triggers a simple or complex behavior. A stimulus is going to trigger in this situation a communication. This is going to, uh, the dance itself is the stimulus that's going to trigger either the reception or the lack of reception of food being close or food being far. Same idea with the auditory. Um, another way to look at communication is through chemical. There's chemical communication that occurs in the animal world and it also occurs in humans. So chemicals can be utilized for communication. What do I mean by this? Chemicals are used such as pheromones. Pheromones are a great chemical that animals use in order uh, that is used between individuals. So pheromones are used between INDS for individuals. Let me underline pheromones. Used between individuals specifically in order to attract the opposite sex. This is order to attract opposite OPP for opposite sex. So those are chemical signals. And then there are also things like scent markings. Scent markings are powerful chemical signals that you see a lot of the times. Dogs are very prominent for their scent markings, so are cats. Scent markings are usually the idea of utilizing things like urine and also feces. These two things are very strong scent markers in order to mark territory. And this is, of course, a, visual, a, a chemical communication. Mark territory. Other animals will smell and notice this scent. They will, there will be a transmission by the animal that it has the territory. There will be a reception by the animal that's trying to get to the territory. And hopefully we get a mutual recognition that this territory is already taken. Thus, communication in the animal world. Um, and this is all due to, and we all, and I've mentioned this, but I just want to write it down. You gather info through smell in this situation. So smell is considered a auditory, uh, I mean, a chemical communication mechanism in animals. So through smell, smell, chem chemicals, basic idea, very clear. Um, two, one final communication that we can look at is uh, called tactile communication. I'll do that one right over here tactile communication. This one's very, very simple. It's simply when you touch, when there's physical touch or physical contact. So this is just touching communication or um, physical contact. No examples here. It's very clear, very simple to understand. Um, uh, a great way to really drive home this communication point is to look at an example that encompasses a lot of them. And that example um, is courtship rituals. This is a very, very well-studied behavior amongst geneticists. 
courtship rituals, specifically in a geneticist's favorite animal, the fruit fly, Drosophila melangaster, in fruit flies. Courtship rituals in fruit flies actually show uh, chemical communication. They show the release of pheromones. They show tactile communication in which the male is going to be uh, actually physically um, touching and communicating with the female. And it also shows auditory communication in which the male starts singing, making this noise with its uh, wing. This is something that I highly suggest you YouTube. It's very, very interesting to watch a courtship ritual between a male and a female fruit fly. You'll see the male constantly run around, chase the female, trying to make sure, trying to get the female to literally notice it through tactile communication, through auditory communication. There are a bunch of key steps that the male has to complete in order for the courtship to actually even be successful. Very very interesting thing to watch. Um, and that also concludes our idea of sensory input. Final note on communication. Remember, it's all about transmission and reception, and that transmission and reception is useless unless both organisms understand and mutually recognize what's being received and what's being transmitted, aka the stimulus.